Well, this is, uh, this is so fun. I was flying over here yesterday, and I, I was thinking, gosh, you guys have no idea how much I enjoy this, um, coming back and uh, being with you. Seriously, like it's, I, I, I was thinking yesterday in the plane, I go, I feel like a grandpa. Um, you know, I get to come and play with the kids and then give you back to your elders. You, you know, it's, it's, it's it, you know, people would tell me, gosh, being a grandpa is better than being a dad because you still get to influence you, you still get to play with them, but then they're not really your responsibility anymore. And, uh, and, and, and I was thinking, gosh, that's, that's the way I feel. Like we're still family and I'm in a different role now and I still get to come and, and share some things in your life. But the other thought that came to my mind is, you know, I, none, my, my kids are all still at home right now. Um, we're probably still a couple years away before, you know, my oldest will probably leave the house. And some of you have been through that already, where your, your kids have grown up and, and the day they go off to college or, or they head out. And, and I was just imagining what that day would feel like, you know, and, and there's probably just some serious pain um, of that separation that's, that's never been there. And I've heard some of you talk about that. There's, there's some, some rejoicing, you know, there's some like, okay, you know, there, there's some of that separation that's good and, and it's the right time for that as well. But I'm guessing that um, once the child leaves over time, you begin to uh, see more clearly mistakes that you made. Is that true? I, I, I would guess that would be true because you know how when you're in the middle of something, you don't see it clearly, um, but then sometimes once you're out of the situation, you know, the hindsight thing is 2020, right? You, you look back and go, why didn't I do this? Why, why? I, I couldn't see it at the time, though. You know, it, it, it's like when you're watching a football game and you're screaming, like, why didn't you just pass it to him? You know, and, well, that's easy for you in your living room, you know, because you can see the, you know, on your plasma screen, all the guys that are open and you don't have a 300-pound lineman in your face, you know. Of course, I can see from that view, but when I'm in there and I'm in the pocket and these guys are rushing at me, and in the same way as when I'm in the thick of it, and all these pressures coming towards you of the children and all of life at you, you don't see so clearly. But my guess is, is once you remove yourselves and the kids have moved away, that somehow you look back and you go, ah, oh, why didn't I do this? And you see so clearly. And, and I say that because as I studied Ephesians 3 this week, um, I feel like I saw a lot of things more clearly. Um, and as I've been out of the day in, day out, I still pray for you. I still hang out with the elders. I hang out with Todd. We have conversations, but I'm out of the daily grind of trying to keep this thing going. It's, it's suddenly, wow, I can see some things more clearly. And and the hard part of that is, is as I studied this pas- passage, it really opened my eyes to regrets now and going, wow, I, I really screwed up in some ways. Um, and I can see it more clearly now just through what Paul says here in Ephesians 3, some things that I never saw before. And I think it's because I'm out of it and I think it's because of the study in the Word of God And as we we look at this topic of the Holy Spirit, I even assumed when Todd gave me the topic of the Holy Spirit, I thought, okay, I got this one. I wrote the book on it, you know, type of thing. And yet, as I was led to this passage about the Holy Spirit, this is something you won't find in anything I've ever preached or written about because it's fresh, it's new, it's something the Spirit is just teaching me now about what he does and I, I feel bad that I never really preached this or, or got this to this extent. In Ephesians 3, verse 14, <coughs> we'll be looking at Ephesians three fourteen through 19 today. And I know you've been in the book of Ephesians, so you understand the context of this. But he says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you 
to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Lord, please open this up to us and help us understand this passage this morning by the power of your almighty Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. This passage is very much about the Holy Spirit and his power and the power he can give you. But typically when I think Holy Spirit, I think power. It's power to do this, power to do that, power to perform miracles, power to change people's lives. And yet here he's talking about something different. He's talking about this this inner power for us, a strength that he gives us, a power that he gives us so that we can know and understand the love of Christ, which is beyond knowledge. And at the very end, it's so that you could be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, the goal is clear. The the goal here is, is, is the goal that I've had for you and I have for my own life. It's to be filled with all the fullness fullness of God, right? We, we, we just want to be full. I, I mean, you know, we preach against being shallow, right? That's the opposite of being full or being empty. And, and sometimes in our lives, we feel empty and we, we, we look at, at people's lives and they go, gosh, it seems like he or she has a very shallow relationship with God. It's, there, there's not a depth to it. And there's other times you'll look in someone's life and go, wow, he or she gets it. They're just full full of the Spirit, full of this fullness of God. They're filled with it. And, and, and in this passage, you understand at the very end, he says, so that you may be filled. So all of everything he says is towards this end goal. All of this is so that we wouldn't be shallow, that we wouldn't live empty lives, but that when people looked at us, they saw a fullness a fullness of God, a depth in us, in the very core of our being. And that's why he says, so that, and and a few times he says, so that. So it's this progression, like he gets on his knees and he prays to God. He bows before God, why? So that Christ might dwell in their hearts. Why? So that um, they they, they might... uh, be rooted and grounded in love. And, and why is that? So that you can know this love of Christ. Why is that? So that at the end, you're just this mature, complete person and you're filled with the fullness of Christ. And, and what I learned from this is that if you notice in this passage, Paul is dealing with the inner man. He's dealing with heart issues. And this is one of my regrets. I think that a lot of times I I didn't go to the heart of the issue and I would deal with the symptoms or the byproducts. Um, It's kind of like right now I have a cold, okay? And so I I drink NyQuil every night. Um, I just do, you know. I don't even use the little cap thing. I just... (laughs) You guys do that? It's like, oh, mm, I'm about a cap full, you know. And uh, it just puts me out to sleep, you know, because the symptoms is I just cough and whatever else. But NyQuil takes care of all of that. And, and I'm, you know, sucking on, you know, uh, cough drops. Even during worship, I'm just, you know, cough drops, blowing my nose, dealing with it. But, but, but probably what I need to do is eat some vegetables, um, you know, and, and work on the core, the overall health, and so my body can actually fight off this thing. But instead, you know, NyQuil's fine, and it just gets me through the night. And, uh, and, and when I, I, I look at um, ministry, I, I think a lot of times I would look at external issues, like 
uh, man, why don't you serve? Why don't you give more? Why don't you, uh, you know, love the people in your neighborhood? Why don't you share your faith? You know, why do you keep looking at pornography? Why don't you guys just get along? Why do you guys keep fighting in your marriage? Why are you holding on to all this stuff? Why are you, you know, you're so greedy and you just want more and more and more? See, but these are all symptoms of a deeper heart issue of you don't understand how much you have in Jesus Christ. You don't understand this love relationship. You don't understand. I mean, do you understand who it is that loves you and how much he loves you? If you got that, you would look at your stuff and go, I don't care. I don't care about this. I don't care about that. Man, it's just the, at the core issue. Paul prays for that. He goes, man, I'm praying for your inner man. Not these external things. Not these physical things, not these symptoms, but there's something about the core of your being. Because if you really understood the love of Christ, you would with great joy sell everything you have and go, man, i got to have this love of Jesus. And, uh, and as I looked, I go, wow. The problem is we don't understand how good God is. And some of us in this room don't understand the love of God like we should and the depth of that, how wide and long and high and deep. We kind of do. We kind of get it. And so we kind of follow. And if we really understood, man, we would, it changes us. And that's the miracle that Paul's praying for here. It's not a miracle of a physical healing or some manifestation that way, but of of the core of your being, that you would understand this love. And Paul prayed for this because he he knew there was nothing he could do physically to cause this, to make it happen. See, and while I see some of the things I did wrong was that Paul dealt with the heart and really got to the core, and sometimes I dealt with symptoms. The other thing was Paul really committed to pray, whereas I oftentimes committed to work and try harder, and maybe I can craft the perfect sermon, or maybe through this counseling session, I would really get it across, or this program, and, and I need to confess that to you, that I, when I look at this passage, I go, I did not pray hard enough for you. The beautiful thing is that I think I've been praying harder for you this week than when I was actually living here. And the beautiful thing is that this can still happen, um, and I praise God for that, that I could get on my knees and I, I picture your faces and go, God, I want them to get the depth of your love. And uh, I want them to understand. And, and, and see, because Paul, notice what he says. He goes, for this reason, I bow my knees. I get on my knees. And, and that's not the only way that we pray. I mean, there are other times in Scripture when someone stands and prays, other times when they're sitting and, I, and then they pray. But there's something about bowing and getting on your knees. And, and we, it's, it's, in our culture, we don't bow before anyone. You know, in their culture, they did. They would bow before kings, bow before monarchs. But, but maybe it's a good thing that we don't bow before people. Um, so that this is the one instance in which we do. You know, so it's not like, oh, we bow before a king, we bow before this guy, we bow before God. No, we don't really bow for anyone. But, but this is pretty cool that we, we, we could do this gesture, this, this, this posture of prayer where we just get on our knees and say, okay, I've met my match. That is not even a clue. I surrender. Who in the world am I? I am getting on my knees. I'm getting on my face. You're almighty God. I bow before you. And Paul says, man, I bow before. This is the reason. You want to know why I bow? He goes, I'm bowing on your behalf. I'm bowing in prayer for you. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father from every family in heaven on earth. His name, I'm bowing before the creator of everyone. I'm bowing before our God, the one that saved us and gave us his name, Christian. You know, that we, we've all taken on this name, no matter what background denomination you came from. 
You know, the, the, the bottom line is right now, you really take on the name of Christ, and we have become a part of his family, and we bow before him. And he says, according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you. See, that's a, such a key word there that he may grant you to be strengthened. See, Paul understood this. It was something that God just grants to a person. I can't, no matter how hard I work, I can't make you understand how much Jesus loves you. God has to supernaturally do that by the power of his Holy Spirit. And at some point you just get it, and, and while we waver in and out of that, it's, it's the Holy Spirit that keeps you getting it. It's granted to you, and it happens through prayer. That means uh, if you come in here and you do not love Jesus Christ, and you do not understand that Jesus Christ really loves you, I am not going to talk you into that right now. It's something God's got to... Just do, and that's why Paul understood, I'm going to get on my knees. It's, it's like this. Well, when Lisa and I lived in Simi Valley, we always had people living with us. And we had this one gal that lived with us a long time, <coughs> Rochelle. And uh, so we tried to marry her off. And, um, and we would always, it was kind of fun to us. We would try to set her up. Even all our kids prayed that Rochelle would get married, you know, and we would just, hey, hey, we tried to set her up with some of you, you, you know, it was just, you, you know, and some of you guys are nodding your heads, and it was just like anything, you know, and, you know, it's like, hey, Rochelle, we got a plumber coming over today. He's single, you know, after he fixes the sink, come out with cookies, you know, and I'll go, oh, Rochelle, you're always baking, you know. If you're not at the gym or praying, you're baking. Yeah, oh, what a what a great wife you'll be, you know. And and uh, you know we'd embarrass the heck out of her, you know. But just always trying to set her up, and you know it's like, hey, what do you think of Rochelle, you know? And uh, it's great, isn't she? Don't you want to marry her, you know? And and you know, and and, and sometimes you know they'd be like, I, I know she's she's nice, she's nice, you know. Or sometimes Rochelle would go, oh no, he's fine, he's nice. But we, we can't make them fall in love, right? It's like it's just either there or not. She ended up falling in love on her own, you know, and, uh, and getting married, and she's pregnant now, great, great, you know. But, um, but it's, it's, it's almost like that where it's the same thing here. I can't make you fall in love with Jesus. I can make the introduction, okay? You can walk in this room, and I can tell you, listen, God, who, so, who, the creator of the world, the only one that matters. He so loves you. More than your wife, more than your kids, more than your mom, your dad, any friend, any girlfriend, boyfriend. He's crazy about you. He so loved the world so much that he gave his son. Man, do you understand how wicked you were, how much you rebelled against him? And he, he loved you in the midst of that. While you were a sinner, he gave his son. Can you believe that? His son. And, and he watched his son on a cross I mean, who does that? What kind of love is that that watches his son die for someone else? And and, and then his son rises from the grave. After being buried for three days, he just gets up by the power of the Spirit, and he's just talking and, you know, ascends back into heaven, and then he can put his Spirit inside of you. He'll change everything. What an amazing God. And some of you will go, hmm, that's nice. And I can make that introduction, and seriously, nothing will happen until somehow here, like Paul says, the Holy Spirit gives you a strength to know, to know, an interesting phrase, that you may know the love of Christ that surpasses Knowledge. He lets you know something that you can't know. You get to a a depth of this real understanding in your inner man, this knowledge of God loves us. Oh, how he loves us. 
And we sing these songs with this depth and this understanding of, oh, I get that. Oh, how he loves us. See, I can make the introduction, but for you to get that love, that happens as I get on my knees and pray for this and say, God, would you grant this to them? Because if they got your love, they wouldn't love their sin so much. If they got your love, they wouldn't fight with each other. You realize there has never been, never in the history of this earth, a spirit-filled couple that has divorced. Never. So the issue is not about his needs or her needs or love languages or this or that. The issue is somehow, as individuals, you don't understand the love of Jesus. You don't understand him. You don't get him. You haven't been filled with that love. And so that's why you start fighting and arguing and quarreling. It's because of that emptiness that you want that other person to fill. It all goes back to this. See, that's the core issue. I think about how many hours I've wasted counseling in marriages when it really wasn't about the marriage. And it's like, no, you don't really understand how much God loves you, do you? You don't really understand this love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, do you? You don't understand how much you would just be filled just in him to where you'd be overflowing, and so you need this and need this from other people. So let me just get on my knees and pray that you would really understand the love of Christ, that you'd be strengthened into the, in the inner man, not the outer. Man, we all understand the outer. You, some of you guys spent a lot of time this morning looking at the outer man or outer woman, um, fixing it up, looking right and everything else. And how much time did you spend on that inner man? Just praying, no, it's about my soul. My soul is ugly right now. And I, and I want this, I need this love of Christ to get it. So we work and we work and we work. <clears throat> Let me ask you something. Because it's about knowing the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Are you sure right now? Are you sure? Don't quickly answer this one. Don't nod your head. This is just between you and God. No one needs to know. You can keep the facade going. But between you and God, are you sure right now that Jesus Christ is crazy about you? Are you 100% sure, not that he so loves the world, but that he so loves you as an individual? Do you, can you really come with that type of security before God and go, I know, I know before, on a shadow of a doubt that you love me? Or is there a part of you that's insecure? Going, I don't know. I, I think he loves me. I, 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 th- I mean, I've been told it my whole life. I've been a part of this church. But right now, as I have to confess to you that I go in and out of this sometimes. And there have been times as I look back, I go, gosh, the Lord is just revealing to me that I minister to some of these symptoms because I I have some of these issues. And and there are times I'm so sure of the love of Christ that he loves me and I can sing that, oh, how he loves me. But the way that I wander, the way that I am prone to wander is I wander toward insecurity. And I wander back toward trying to earn it somehow. And I think you guys have seen some of that pattern in my life. And so no doubt that reflection is going to come into some of your lives too. Of this coming in and out. Of this assurance. And so I've got to ask you again, right now, are you sure that God loves you? A friend of 
friend of mine was just sharing about his own life just yesterday, and he, he quoted a verse that I preached two years ago, but I haven't preached in a long time. It's, it's John 15, 9, where, where that, before you even turn there, let me ask you something. How much do you think God the Father loves his son? <laughs> okay, try to, try to imagine that. Just right now, how much do you think right now God the Father loves Jesus? Pretty good amount. Pretty much a perfect love, right? That's why John 15, 9 is one of the most difficult passages for some of us, like me, to embrace. Because in John 15, 9, Jesus says, just as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in that love. Think about that. Just as? In so much as, in the same way as the Father loves you, that's how much you love me? Come on. Shouldn't the verse read, just as the Father has loved me, Cut that in half, you know, or a third, or I mean, cause that's the way I feel sometimes, right? You, know, you, 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 some of you hear that verse. Some of you, some of you guys get the love of God and praise God for that. I am so grateful for you, and I learn from some of you. But some of you struggle like I do in believing that verse and going, "No way, that much, as much as the Father loves you." That's what you think of me? And it's even going back to the John 3, 16, that God so, that that word so. It's like, ah, I I believe he loves, but so love the world, like that much? Jesus, I believe you love me, but just as the Father loves me? See, that's why for us to comprehend that, I cannot physically comprehend that. It is a knowledge, it's a love that I can't know just physically. I can't just study and know that. I can't just, you know, check it off on an exam. Something has to happen through the power of the Holy Spirit to where I get it. It's a power, that it's a strength that is required for us to get the love of God and that only comes through the Holy Spirit. And so we try, try, try. Many of you, you know, talk to me and you say, hey, how can I help my husband understand the love of God? How can I share with my friend at work to get the love of God? And, I'm go- and every time I tell you, I go, man, that's the million dollar question. You can't, you can't make someone else fall in love. But unlike a physical relationship, in this one you can actually pray like Paul does and get on his knees on behalf of that person. And so I I say, you know, I, I do know that God loves me. And there have been times and there are periods when I am so secure in that. And there are other times when I am not. And that's me. Different people have different issues. This is mine. And I also realize I have not prayed about that issue as much. When I pray for the power of the Holy Spirit, I pray for times like this. God, give me a power so that I can impact other people's lives that I love. Empower me, gift me for the common good. These are all biblical good prayers. And yet I've neglected this one in my own life and for, the, for others. I don't pray enough. Okay, God, now empower me, strengthen me so that I can understand your love for me. And uh, empower these people in this room, whom I love, strengthen them right now by the power of your Holy Spirit so that they can know your love and rest secure in it. Security. That's what I'm praying for this morning. Security. Do 
debating whether or not to share something because it's kind of weird, but I, I think I'm supposed to share it. Yesterday, yesterday I woke up with a weird, weird dream. You ever, you, you know, you have you wake up in the middle, and you normally don't remember your dreams, but I remembered mine from yesterday. Yesterday morning, I woke up. Woke up. It was a weird one of those dreams that didn't make sense. I am. Uh, I was playing with a, a buddy of mine, Jesse, and uh, we were competing in something, and he was winning, which right then I should have known it was a dream. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, it's how suddenly you're in a room, and then suddenly it's weird, like that you were actually in an airplane, you know, but you thought it was a room like this, and you're playing basketball, and suddenly he says, hey, you know, let's go to my uncle's and get some avocados, and you know, it's like, you know how random things, but it makes sense in your dream, you know, and like, oh yeah, yeah, of course, avocados would come next, and, uh, and then he opens the door, like it would have been like this door, and I, that's when I found out, wow, we're in midair, you know, in an airplane, and he has this yellow backpack thing, and he's getting ready to jump out, and he throws one to me, and, and he's like, you know, so I strap this thing on, and, and I'm going, what is, this is a parachute? It didn't look like a parachute, you know, it's some crazy, weird, yellow backpack thing. And he goes, just trust me. And I'm like, where do I pull? Where do I pull? And he just jumps out of the plane, and he starts tumbling backwards. And I just remember going there, I don't know if this thing works. I don't know. He's like, trust me. But I, I think, ah, it's Jesse. He says that all the time, and he's in the wrong half the time, you know. And, uh, and I'm just going, man, I don't know. I don't know. What do I pull? pull something? What do I do? And right then I woke up, you know, and I was like, wow, good, good, you know? And, and it was one of those weird, I don't know if you ever do this where you wake up and you think, okay, because you're so confused in the dream, then you figure out the solution. And, uh, and so I, I think, okay, okay. And then you try to jump back in the dream because it's still early in the morning. So I thought I'm going to fall back asleep and dream that the parachute worked. And, and, uh, but I never could fall back asleep. Yeah, I drank more NyQuil. It, it, it just, but, but, but it's, it, it's, it's, uh, but, but then I woke up and I just kept thinking about that dream yesterday morning and, uh, and, and going, okay, is there, was there a point to it? You, you know, um, I don't know, I'm a big dream guy or whatever, but I, whatever it, it, whatever the point, there probably wasn't anything. What I got from it was, <coughs> there's some things you don't want to screw around with, <laughs> you, Right? Um, and I woke up because there was just this nervousness of, I am about to risk my life jumping out, not sure if this is a backpack or a parachute, <laughs> and not sure if I'm going to figure out on the way down what to pull, because there were no straps or there were no instructions. There was nothing. And, uh, and I share that because, you know what, this, this thing about the love of Christ and this security is, is, is not something we mess around with, right? You don't want to go, I think he loves me. I think I get the love of Christ. I, uh, I think I understand his grace. Um, it's something we all want to be secure in, right? And, uh, and I apologize if I... Because I... I I'm still growing in this area in a big way, in a big way, um, not a little way. And I, you guys know I confess my stuff to you, but I, I don't think I really understood the depth of this one, of how my insecurity can then come out and some of the result of that, it can be uh, pushed on to other people. And... Uh, and when I don't really get the security at times, then I will minister out of insecurity and, and treat symptoms rather than the heart issue. And so even right now, my tendency would be to try to fix everything with a sermon. And what I learned from this is you, you, you don't do that. And there's a power in prayer that we have to trust. There's a power of the Holy Spirit that we have to trust. <laughs> And so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to have Jared come up and just, just play softly. But what I'm going to ask you for is I, I want, as I'm going to be praying for you in the weeks to come and, 
And I, I, you know, I think this is, I, I really love this, coming back and, and seeing things more clearly and coming back and sharing with you and doing that on a, on a regular basis. It's like a grandfather type of relationship where I can still pour into your life and pray for you and, uh, and yet not be there every day. Um, I ask that you would pray for me, that I really get, uh, that the Holy Spirit would fill me with a deeper security in this love. And I'm going to be praying that for you, that your inner man and the inner man, you would be strengthened so that you really would get this. And even right now, I, I asked Jared to play just to drown out any other noise, but some of you have friends and relatives and people you work with and you care about very much. And you know there's an emptiness in their life because they don't, get this love of Christ. That's the heart issue. And you've been treating their symptoms and trying to fix this, fix that, get them off drugs, get them to be less greedy, get them to quit worrying about their future. And bottom line, that's not the issue. The issue is something supernaturally the heart needs to be changed. <coughs> like the passage Todd quoted last week from, from Ezekiel where they've got a heart of stone and it needs to be turned into flesh and they need to get the love of Jesus. And what I'm going to invite you to do for those who are comfortable is to bow and uh, you know, bow your knees and get on your knees and pray for those people who might even be in this room. And then there's some of you here that you are so insecure right now, so unsure. It's like that parachute backpack. You go, I don't know. Man, I don't even know where I am with God right now. But I certainly don't know this love. And you need prayer for yourself. During this time, I'm going to invite you to come up to the stage and just get on your knees just along the front of the church and the elders, and I'm going to ask some of the community group leaders to come up and just lay hands on you and pray for you that something supernatural would happen because that's the only chance we have that God would grant to you through the riches of his glory to know this love of Jesus. And maybe some of you will get it today, and then those of you that get it, man, get baptized right after worship. We'll celebrate that knowing of the love of Christ.